Welcome to Mechanics of Composite Materials. Today we'll be covering the manufacturing processes of polymer matrix composites. I'll be going to more detail later on on this topic, but this topic is more a material science topic. And so we'll be talking about, first we'll be talking about resin composite processing. As we discussed earlier, composite materials comprise of fibers that are embedded in a matrix. So the fiber takes the majority of the strength while the matrix keeps all the fibers together. So the matrix will be of a similar consist consistency as glue, while the fiber will be, say carbon fiber is pretty strong fiber. And those fibers are embedded in this matrix, which I'm calling resin, could be a resin, for example. And there are in a one-step processing application, which is many commercial applications, the fiber and the matrix are usually processed directly into the finished product. And three examples of that, which I'll be going into more detail later, is filament winding and protrusion and resin transfer molding. I'll discuss those later on as we move through this course. A two-step processing is a situation where the fibers are incorporated into the matrix. And when you do that, you are forming an intermediate product form. We call that B staging, and I'll discuss that later. And later is processed to form laminates, right? So we discuss how a laminate is comprised of lamina. And the lamina in this case is the intermediate product form. I put all the lamina together. I stack it up in, at different ply angles. And then I'm able to then process it further through an autoclave, uh, which then allows me to get the finalized product. So two-step process first, fibers are incorporated in the matrix in the intermediate product. Then we're gonna go ahead, it's partially together, right? And then I'm gonna put all the lamina together to form the laminate, uh, which is gonna be made up of a bunch of lamina at different angles, ply angles. And when I say ply angles, what I'm really talking about is that the fiber orientation from lamina to lamina can be different. And I discussed some of that in a previous lecture, in the introductory lecture. We call that pre-preg. So when you have fibers are impregnated in, with matrix uh, to form the in, in intermediate product, we're calling that a pre-preg because it's pre-impregnated tape within the resin, which is thin sheets of fibers basically impregnated with a predetermined amount of uniformly distributed polymer matrix, typically the resin content can be 30 to 45% by weight in aerospace applications. A sheet molding compound is a situation where you have thin sheets of fiber pre-compounded with a thermal set resin, um, and that tends to be a lower tech application. So there, there are three primary processes uh, process steps in the composite manufacturing. You have the fiber impregnated with the resin, which is basically a partial, partial cure. So it's not fully cured. When I say full cure, I'll discuss it more later, but it means that the composite has fully hardened. The resin has hardened completely and it has is going to retain its shape. You also have the fiber matrix assembly. Um, and in that step, you have you could have either uni tape or weave, and then you're going to do ply cutting, and then you will configure it into the right shape. The composite set uh, is set then into a final structural form, and that can be achieved by applying heat and pressure. And I'll, again, I'll discuss some of this in a lot more detail in, in a future lecture. Dif different manufacturing process can route. Uh, routes uh, can be used. And you have control of fiber and matrix contents, so you can control that. Um, so that means I can control the amount of resin content and depending upon the amount of resin content, the quality of the product is affected. And these different manufacturing processes routes can affect also the quality of the composite, like voids. Um, you could have voids within the composite. Voids may not be a good thing. If I have voids within a composite, within the resin, then those act like stress concentration. And those stress concentrations can then affect the performance of the composite. You have productivity, the process cycle time, and the cost. 
and the manufacturing processes that you could have uh, can can vary. Uh, so, for example, um, I'm listing a, a number of them from top to low. And here I am uh, describing the performance and the cost. Okay, so that's some of the aspects we're discussing here. So we have uh, the pre prick with autoclave pressure cure. So you're going to have that pre prick which is partially cured. The fiber and the resin are partially cured, meaning that it's semi hardened. You can still mold it. And the resin can flow once it's heated up. So you can put it into auto clip with pressure to cure it further. Then you have pre prick with vacuum bag only, meaning I'm not applying any pressure, just um, or, or thermal environments, and I'm only applying a vacuum bag. We call that auto autoclave. So I'm not using an autoclave pressure uh, vessel, uh, but I'm now only doing it for a vacuum bag. I'm only pulling vacuum into the material I'm trying to um, basically process. Then we have filament winding. We have resin transfer molding. We have protrusion. Compression molding, hand layup and spray lay, spray up, and then reinforced resin injection molding, and then we also have the new technologies of the future, which we'll discuss on them, like additive manufacturing, uh, fiber, advanced fiber placement technology, which I will cover later as well. It's not a new technology anymore, but it's something to talk about. And so these are the various manufacturing processes where you can take composites. Uh, and, and you can take the fibers and the resin and create a, a solidified structure that can work for your application. So very different from what you may have been used to with metals, which is a little bit simpler. So here you can see an example of a pre prick manufacturer. Uh, what you can see here is how the fiber and the matrix are combined into a single layer. We're only looking at a single layer that has been impregnated with resin of choice. So here you can see the carbon fiber spools uh, being then impregnated, right, into this resin film. And you can see that here. Um, and then as that's occurring, uh, you also have a waste release paper uh, over here. And then you're taking this material and then uh, spooling it in this manner. And that's your pre prick And you can see this pre prick will be flexible enough. The resin again is pre preg and is B stage. What I mean with B stage is that it has gone through some polymerization. And that provides some tack uh, for the lip um, and it will be sticky. So I can then take layers of this, cut them up at different angles. So here I've cut up, we cut a, a, a layer out or a lamina out. And I can cut more of this and stack them up. And you have some stickiness. And the reason it's sticky is because you have a partial cure. It's not fully cured. So things can still flow when I heat them up. The material can then be, be pre pregged. Uh, and you can uh, pre preg as a unidirectional tape or a weave fabric. And then the pre preg is then delivered to the manufacturer for cure. Uh, and it's going to have a specified resin content and fiber alignment. Uh, they, they, they can be temperature sensitive. So sometimes these pre pregs are shipped in a uh, frozen or, or free, uh, frozen temperatures, cold temperatures, uh, to maintain the overall health of the resin primarily. Okay. Okay, so draping, I want to go back to the idea of draping. So when, when I talked about draping here, what I really mean is that it allows you to take a a, a, a sheet of lamina and you're able to lay it down into a tool. That tool can be any shape. And so when I say drape, it's kind of when you drape your curtains or you're, you're basically setting things on a tool and it allows you to shape it into that tool. So that's what, what, I, what I mean with draping. And secondly, I want to point out here is how the auto autoclave works. In essence, you're going to have some amount of resin flow and the vacuum bag allows you to pull out all the potential voids between the lamina uh, so that the 
polymers can cross-link between one layer to another. And so then the resin hardens, and then you have a composite structure that has been formed. Again, a pre-prig lamina, so you're going to have a single lamina here when I cut it out of here. Um, I'm going to get a laminate once I take these pieces and put them together, right? I stack them up on top of each other, and you can see you have a ply angle, say zero degrees. I can cut it so I can get different ply angles. And I'll stack it up to get the highest performance I want for my application. And the idea there is to then cure it to get uh, a solid laminate. You have pre prick processing, which is offline impreg impregnation. You have the resin film production, uh, which is done separately. And you have a release liner, typically a release film. And so here an ex example of a 3M application or, or product. And you have this matrix material applying this to this coating unit. And now you take the fibers and impregnate them into the resin. And you can see there's a heating table uh, and these things are getting uh, basically wrapped up together. And then you have this cooling table section here that brings everything together even better uh, into that product that you see here. This, and you can see here, that as it's been unrolled, it, it seems to be flexible. And the reason it's flexible is because it's partially cured uh, and it has the ability to be draped. Okay, so moving on here, we have pre-preg rules. You know, what are some good prepreg rules? Uh, the user has to specify to the prepreg supplier. So if you're manufacturing a surfboard, it's up to you to then specify to the prepreg supplier what kind of resin you need, what fiber you need, what fiber sizing you need, and what surface treatment you need, toe size, and also the resin content. And the cost for this kind of prepreg can range anywhere between $800 to $3,000 per pound, so it's, it's expensive. And sometimes you will have a minimum purchase of 50 pounds. So, so now you're really looking at high cost uh, for the application. The pre prick materials are very temperature sensitive and it must be shipped and stored at low temperatures. We discussed that earlier at minus 40 C typically to prevent the material from reacting. The supplier will provide a cure schedule to the, for the material, and then the supplier will also provide a recommended max out time at room, temp room temperature. What I mean with that is this, this roll of composite la lamina is a prepreg, and that's going to be stored at minus 40 C and shipped to you. Now, you have to do some work on it. You have to cut it. You have to put things together. To be able to do that, the manufacturer typically will say, okay, this material, if it's left outside, can stay out for so long. And so that's, that's what I mean with out time. And that's very important uh, for this application to make sure that we're not violating this max out time. Because if you violate the max out time, the resin may not perform as intended. Every time the supplier removes from the refrigeration, the pre prick will lose some of its life. That's the bottom line. So you take it two times out, it's going to be different from when you take it 10 times out. And if you take it 10 times out, you can expect a life reduction from the max out time period. A typical max out time can range anywhere between seven to 30 days. And how you come up with this, the suppliers do a tremendous amount of testing to determine those inputs. Okay, that's, that's the way it works. The pre-prig has to be removed from the freezer upon which is then need, you need to defrost it. Of course, if I wanna be able to use this material, I cannot use it frozen. I have to let it thaw, kind of like when you make a cake at home, like you buy a frozen cake and you need to heat it up, whatever, is the same process. You have to leave it outside until it comes back to room temperature. Typically three hours should be good enough. And the reason for that, for needing that particularly to take that step 
is that you don't want to have uh, moisture from reacting with the prepreg resin. And why are you going to have moisture? Is because you have condensation. And so if you take something that's really, really cold and you heat it up, it's going to have condensation. So it's better for things to kind of defrost at room temperature and then you can take over. The reason for this is to prevent moisture from reacting with the prepreg resin, like I said, this can lead to serious issues with both epoxies and cyanoester resins. Um, and it needs to be considered in your application to make sure you're not making an error in that arena. Moisture will increase the kinetics of polymerization for epoxies. And you're gonna, you're gonna also have higher viscosity, um, which will decrease consolidation, consolidation, consolidation and negatively impact predefined cure schedule. So again, you're going to have some issues that need to be considered. And you can see here the effects of moisture on the viscosity of the epoxy. On the y-axis, I have the viscosity. On the x-axis, I have time. And so definitely there is an effect uh, that's going to be um, due to the effects of moisture. Uh, and so that needs to be considered in your assessments. Okay, so if the material, um, if we have a concern that something has gone wrong, there are ways we can look at that. We can, we can examine the material using some advanced techniques. And we can also look at whether the material has aged. And that's what I talked about. When, if you leave the material out, okay, for a period of time, it could degrade significantly the, the performance of that material. And we use the word aging for that, okay? And so uh, we have a, a, we can perform a GPS, DSC, GPC and DSC and a rheology scan. And that can provide insights into the degree of the advancement of how much the material has aged as an example. And so those are, techniques that have been used successfully in, in composite materials uh, that allow you to determine whether something has gone wrong, okay, with the material. And, and you may ask me, what is DSC? So DSC is a differential scanning calorimetry. And it's a machine that allows you to perform a thermal analysis uh, that allow you to determine the degree of cure, the glass transition temperature, and melting point of the composite material. So those are good things that are done to really understand the quality of the material as you move forward. Okay, so, uh, so that's some of the things that are done. Uh, there's also the gel permeation chromatography, that's GPC, and that's also performed to understand the degree of, uh, of permeation of the material, the viscosity, okay? So here, what you can see is the rheology scan as a function of aging. And you can see that you have changes of, in the material as you ver check you know, for, say, there's a temperature in the cure application. You can see how uh, you have no advancement versus some advancement versus further advancement. So the rheology scan can provide some information on that. And that can be looked at in terms of viscosity as well. A typical DSC for epoxy is going to look like this. You have a heat flow. Uh, basically, um, you also have a plot against temperature. And the DSU then is measured, is used to measure the degree of cure of the resin by quantifying the heat of exotherm of the unreacted product. And a smaller delta H means that I have a more age or reacted the polymer. So the lower the delta H, the, the more issues I have with um, the aging of that polymer. And then here at the bottom left, I have aging of prepreg may significantly affect viscosity profile. This will also result in lower gel times. So I can use uh, GPC to understand that. Uh, and I can understand how much, you know, uh, how, how it could affect uh, the final TG. 
And so, yeah, so viscosity does play a role. Gelation points, mean viscosity, rates of, of advancements. You can use this information to discriminate good and bad lots from each other. You can do that as well. Here, you can see how uh, peak temperatures also decrease with aging. Uh, you, you can see here the DSC showing delta H decreases as function of aging and thermal exposure. So you can see that uh, these factors can affect, um, uh, the delta H can affect the aging and thermal exposure. Okay, and, and the delta H decreasing as a function of aging and thermal exposure can indicate issues, right? So if I have a low delta H, uh, then that could mean I have some sort of issue going on. So pre-preg quality evaluation, how do I check that my income in pre-preg um, is good? So you bought, you're trying to manufacture a surfboard or a table made of composites, and you want to know, hey, why is, is this material any good? So you could then uh, assume for a second that sign ester, you could perform an FTIR. And I know I'm throwing at you a lot of different um, um, Acronyms, uh, but uh, FTIR is a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Okay, and that allows us to understand how strong are the interactions within the composite. And the FTIR uh, provides very little information as incoming quality check. You can make sure with FTIR you can check whether the material you received is the correct one. So that's why it's good, because if you purchased, say, a sign and ester, but you re received epoxy instead, an FTIR can at least tell you if there's, hey, you know, there must be, I, I think there's sign and ester, not epoxy, so I must have gotten the raw material. An FTIR can also be used to follow the early stages of cure. And it's gonna help you understand if you're early in the process of the staging process of, of the cure. Um, and so here you can see that FTR was performed and this provides some images. And then these images are gonna tell you how much you have of each material. It could tell you, hey, I have this much epoxy, this much resin, this much cyanide. Uh, it's gonna give you some information, some clues about the composition of the of the material through this, this FTIR, this Fourier transform process. You also have DSC, like I said, and you can then scan the prepreg as a function of temperature. And by, by doing that, you can then determine the delta H as I discussed before, and that's gonna give us a lot of clues about whether the degree of cure has been compromised or not. Note, I wanna make sure you understand the fiber does not contribute to the heat of exotherm value uh, but it could influence errors, right, based on the content of the filler. So really is the resin really driving these things, which makes sense because the resin is there to glue things together. So that's, again, we're, when we're evaluating pre -pre quality, we're looking at things that could affect the ability to glue things together. And so we use the heat of extra therm and make sure that that degree of extra term is greater than a particular value that may be provided by a supplier to make sure it's good material. The pre preg uh, quality evaluation, again, uh, we talked about GPC, uh, gel permission chromatography, uh, or high pressure uh, chromatography. And so these methods usually allow one to dissolve the pre preg resin in a solvent. We take the material then and then inject it into the instrument and then we filter out uh, the different components by either molecular weight or functional group. So here you can see an example of that. I don't want to go into extensive detail on this because this course is not a material science class but it's intended to give you some background as to how these things work. Okay so so we want to keep that in mind as we move forward. I'm just giving you an overview and not the, the, the whole science necessarily. Um, and so 
And here you have the, the information that will give you the constituents that you have in this material. It can verify proper ratio of constituents, um, which constituents uh, make up that resin, the catalyst, the monomers. Um, it verifies the, uh, the amount of reaction product formed, uh, whether it's acceptable or not. It can also reverse engineer and identify the constituents with the FTIR to make sure that you actually do have the right materials as it was told. Then you have the TAC that allows you to evaluate uh, how sticky is a pre prepared material. If the material has been out of the outer clay for a long time, you expect the stickiness to go down. And so there are tests that you can do to, to really study that. And yeah, there's automated processes to look at that. Uh, and, and it's something that I would like you to look at more in detail later. There's also more bigger picture perspective testing that should be done for you to be able to accept the prepreg. And those tests, so anytime you buy a prepreg from a supplier, you wanna make sure you've done some testing to understand. So this testing is more in the chemical, chemistry point of view. This testing here is more from the uh, mechanical point of view, right? So for pre, and some chemical involved. So pre prep testing is gonna involve visual and dimensional. You're gonna look at volatile content. You're gonna look at moisture content, gel time, resin flow, tack, fiber aerial, aerial weight, infrared analysis, liquid chromatograph, and then different, differential scanning calorimetry, right? So those are the things we're gonna look at. And for lamina properties, which are the mechanical type, so you have to load them up in some way maybe, or they will give you fundamental properties that are useful for analysis. That will include density, fiber volume, resin volume, void content, and then uh, the ply thickness, glass transition temperature. Okay, those are important. And then some testing that you may do mechanical testing, which we'll discuss later on. But these are the kinds of tests you wanna do to make sure the material that were received incoming are of high quality. Simple mechanical test, uh, measured TG. Okay, we wanna measure TG, we wanna measure void content and through an image cross-section analysis to make sure that the resin content is the right one. Um, and also we wanna look at the fiber volume, which means we need to dissolve the matrix, right? We need to di dissolve the matrix in sulfuric acid then determine the weight of the fiber versus the total weight. And you may ask my, you may ask what is DMA? DMA is a dynamic mechanical analysis that's performed. And what is that purpose? What is the purpose of that? Uh, the, the, the dynamic mechanical analysis provides a lot of information and it tells you information about, um, it can measure, for example, the storage modulus and the glass transition temperature. Um, and it can provide a lot of insights about the degree of cure and the quality of the material. So that's why a DMA is important and it's typically done anytime you uh, get material in the lab from a different lab. So you bought material, you wanna do a DMA. In a DMA, uh, what we normally do, uh, we apply a sinusoidal variation of stress to the sample, and then we monitor the resulting deformation. So it's a mechanical test. That's why it's called a dynamic mechanical analyzer. And usually you apply like one hertz of applied loading, and the strain is typically kept constant, typically, uh, and the temperature as well, and is increased. We then increase this at a constant heating rate. Okay, so uh, we increase that and then we're able to determine, hey, you know, how much damping or how much loss we have in the system when this is done. And we're measuring here the storage modulus uh, or basically we wanna understand the TG.
So, so one of the topics I brought up was glass transition temperature. We want to make sure that's clearly understood. The glass transition temperature is a temperature range where the polymer substrate or the resin changes from a rigid glassy material to a soft material, not melted. We're not talking about melting here. And that's usually measured again through the DMA and is measured in terms of stiffness or modulus, okay? And provides a lot of information about the material or how good the quality of the material is. And again, it, it also looks, the glacier shooting temperature also provides in, on, on a clear understanding of the ability of the molecules to be mobile, right? Um, and above the glass transition temperature, the polymer will typically expand in a very uniform way. Um, and is, is, is going to be uh, very important uh, because it's going to provide uh, information about, um, I, I almost call it the DNA, but it's going to provide information about that composite, okay? So here we have the pre-preg layer procedure. We have the pre-preg layer procedure here we have a ply cutter here, the bagging and the inspection. All that needs to be part of your process. Uh, you have the raw materials, we have the pre prick fabric and the pre prick tape. And when I say pre prick tape, what I mean is that the fibers are oriented only one direction. So that could be unidirectional. Pre prick fabric is that I have uh, fibers going in two directions, perpendicular to each other. Uh, then I have to cut, uh, I could use laser as a guide. I have to have tool preparation to make sure that I can then use it to create the, 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 the layup so I can stack it up. I have to stack it up against something, right? We have to stack it up against a tool. Then I have the layup guide, and these are hard templates that provide guidance on how to put everything together. Then I'll lay it up on the tool. So I have aluminum, steel, invar, that could be your tool, and then I'll bring all the plies and stack them up to create the layup. When I say layup, I mean, I'm stacking up more than one lamina into a single laminate. Then I go through a deep bulk process and I have the bagging process. The bagging process means I'm going to take uh, and, and protect uh, the layup in such a manner that can actually pull the vacuum. And, so, and also, so things don't get stuck to each other. So you need the release film so you can release the Composite, you have the fuel ply, the release fabric, the bleeder, the breather, and the vacuum bag. Then you go ahead and cure. You can do it out of autoclave or enclave. And then you'll remove the part and then you will do a non destructive evaluation, which means I'm going to do an inspection procedure to look for any flaws in my part. And then I go into MRB, which means I found an issue. Let's try to figure out what that is. It's a materials review board. There's an issue. Sure, then rework and then maybe fix it. And if everything's okay, go ahead. If nothing, if things are not working well, scrap it. If there's an issue, rework. And after that, I may not have any issues, so I don't have to go to MRB. I go straight to trim and drill and I'll assemble everything very nicely. So I wanna to touch on this again because it may, I may not have been clear, but after you do a non-destructive evaluation, you may see an issue with a part that was that was supposed to be to print. Maybe there's a void or delaminations. That may trigger you to go to materials review board, which every company has, most companies have in aerospace applications. And that board may decide you have to rework or it's good to go, it's, it's just fine the way it is, or you have to do additional work. And so that's after re you rework or use as is, because you can just use it the way it is and it's just fine then you go in into assembly. So that's the gate there. And the second point I wanna make has to, with, has to do with debulking here in this step. And all we're talking about there is pulling vacuum to get all the trapped air out uh, as much as we can so that we can be successful. So here I have a thermal cure of pre-preg. Uh, somebody was asking, what is 45 versus minus 45? Well, you can see here clearly that if I have two plies of 45, that they'll be in the same direction. But clearly minus 45 means that it goes uh, in the opposite direction. So it's measured against a particular axis. 
the layup axis, and all the plies need to be relative to that. So when I say I have plus minus 45, the difference is that one set of plies will follow the 45, and the other set of plies will follow the minus 45. And those two could be different. You can see that they're clearly different in this plot. So these lamina, which are the pre-break lamina, are then cut, and then you stack them up against this tool, and the pre-break is stacked and aligned depending upon the material properties that you want, which is why we're tearing these composites. And then I go through the process of going from solid liquid to gel solid. That's the process I want to follow. And so you have some amount of softening and flow. The viscosity is fairly high. Then things become liquid. And then you have chemical cross-linking. And here, again, the viscosity will be changing. And here, you're going to have an approximate gel point of some kind. Here, I'll go into this more detail, but plies are vacuuming back at room temperature or slightly elevated temperature to remove any, any uh, open air that you may have inside. Uh, so, you know, for example, I have a cell phone and I bought a, a protective film that's glued onto my cell phone. And I kid you not, but it's full of bubbles. And I didn't do it. It was a representative at the store, but uh, you know, I should have done it because I could have removed these bubbles away uh, much efficiently. That's what that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. I'm gluing one material onto another. That's what we're doing with these plies. We're trying to uh, have the resin flow in such a manner that cross links are formed between these plies. Plies. The fibers will keep going in the direction they're going, but at least I can have some amount of uh, consolidation. So once you have this put together uh, in, a, in a vacuum bag environment, you can shove it into an auto clip, which you can see on the right hand side. And the cure can alter alternatively be performed in an oven or with no pressure, or with no pressure and no oven. Um, but at least vacuum bag, because that's going to um, remove the trapped air. Uh, specific pre breaks must be used for these auto auto clip processes. And typically, auto auto clip could result in higher void content and lower fiber volume fraction when that occurs. The tools that are used for composites, the molds used for composites are also known as tools. And that's what we're going to place a pre prick against. So if I'm making a surfboard that's curved, I want a tool in that's curved. Because when I lay down my pre prick, it needs to follow that contour so that when I put in the autoclave under vacuum conditions, it can conform to that tool. And you can see how vacuum back there could be very useful. It will push the lamina into, or laminate into the uh, tooling, which is very, very advantageous. Tooling costs and complexities increase as part of performance requirements and the number of parts. The tool can be flat or complex in curvature. The molds in which high performance composite materials are formed can be made from carbon fiber, monolithic graphite, metals. And you know, there's some benefits going with composites for some of this tooling is the reason is because the coefficient of thermal expansion is fairly low. While that may not be the case for um, other applications. A key issue with tooling for composites is the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch. That's what I just discussed. And so going with high performance applications, you can minimize those issues. And so the more, the higher, uh, when you're going through a heating cure, uh, the CT mismatch between the tool material and the composite has to be accounted for in the dimensional tolerance. And also the quality that you get at the end, because you may have some residual stresses at the end. After also of critical importance is how does the material interact with the resin being utilized. So if you use a material that could have a negative and adverse reaction with the composite, that could be an issue uh, also. Does the material, the tooling produce water? And so now the water affects the resin. So you have to keep in mind all these things as you're working it through. Here's an example of an Invar tool. Invar has a lower coefficient of thermal expansion, which makes it a good application to be using uh, for uh, 
uh, draping composites. Uh, here, you can see there's a high performance part, uh, tooling. High performance tooling is expensive. Invar is a very expensive material. 36% nickel content, and there's various common grades of Invar, but the point is that the thermal expansion is fairly low. And then, uh, yeah, you can look at other grades as well. And here you have large composites, curve tools right here. If that's a single person, you can see how big it is. So here you have tooling for large structures. This is very challenging. Uh, tooling for large parts is a challenge given their size, thermal characteristics and sheer weight. Uh, this master model for C-17 aircraft tail cone was produced using carbon foam covered with carbon bismuth mine, prepeg, correct. So something can be mined, not very easy, uh, but required. However, composite molds are not always appropriate. The James Webb structure needed large parts and they were initially processed on a composite mandrel. The composite resin was assigned an ester. Do you know what happened there? So why we don't take um, and, and think about through that, so mold release agents are used in bagging and what are release agents? So here you can see a release agent. So, okay, let me explain what you're looking at. This is the tooling, the one at the very bottom. And then you have a seal, then you have a vacuum bag. And here's all the different ingredients we need to make this composite happen. Here you can see the pre-preg. So all the layers have been stacked together to get the performance you need. You have a peel ply, release film, bleeder, and all these things will be discussed later. But I wanna talk about this release agent. This release agent is very important because it makes sure, it makes sure that the pre-preg that you're curing does not glue onto the tooling. We don't want that. We don't want it to get it stuck into the mold. Typically, some type of silicone is applied to the metal and baked in. Teflon release film may also be used between the pre prick and the mold. So that's typically the way it's done. And then you have to make sure that the surface preparation must be performed if you need to bond more. So if at the bottom of this pre prick if you plan to go through another cure cycle to glue it to other composites, or not cure cycle, but you want to glue it to a metal or something like that, you need to make sure that surface there has been prepared appropriately for that bonding process. And I'll go through each of these steps in a lot more detail in a future lecture. We're still introducing the idea of composites and, and the different things that are occurring. And I wanted to start from the micromechanics so you understand what we're covering here. We have the general vacuum bagging process and this is old school. So you have tool, you have the laminates and then you have your release fabric and then you have the breather material which allows uniform application of pressure. And then you have, the, you have your vacuum bag and the vacuum pump. This vacuum bag is sealed down uh, on these uh, edges that have, you can see there's tape, usually double tape, double sided tape. And then you pull the vacuum and ensure that the composite can hold the, uh, that the vacuum bag can hold the vacuum and that everything is well put together. The vacuum bagging process, you, you know, you have the breather, which is a loose polyester or glass fabric, and that allows the vacuum to develop to be applied with a collapse or sheet in the bag. So that I'm pointing right now to the breather here. Okay, that one right here in gray. The bleeder, the bleeder, which is right here, right on top of there. So you have the breather, the release film, and then you have the bleeder. The bleeder is, there to, is a fabric that's put adjacent to the pre prig and that allows to draw resin, excess resin out and reduce resin content. So you don't want to have a pre prick that has too much resin because that, that means that you have too much resin content. 
you want a good balance. You don't want voids and you want the right amount of resin. So the bleeder just takes the excess. And then you have the peel ply. You can see the peel ply right there is usually a polymer fiber fabric that has been treated, that can be removed after cure and allows texturing of the composite surface, typically for bonding. And finally, I have the release film that I talked about earlier. It could be a Teflon, for example. So we don't want things to get stuck. The pre-preg is laid out in the required orientation. And depending upon the thickness of the part, if you have a very thick part, you may require multiple debulks. And I talk about how debulks are basically um, trying to remove these voids through a vacuum process or some application of pressure. Debulks are really intermittent vacuums hold, and I'm, I guess I'm defining here, either at room temperature or slightly elevated temperature, so the part can consolidate much easier. And, you know, of course, if you press two laminas together, if there is any voice, if I press it hard, then the voice could come out. And then the cross-linking becomes more natural and more, more, more complete. This is done as a function of plies laid down. The part is typically vacuum back to 30 mini, mi, mm HG and checked for leaks prior to being placed in the autoclave. So you have to make sure that everything, there's no, no leaks in, in your vacuum bagging procedure. The bag must not leak. Good vacuum bath must be provided. And you, what you really want to have, you want to have uniform curing. You don't want to be cured more here than in center. You want to have uniform curing across. And the vacuum bagging process does assist in consolidate, consolidation as well as removal of volatiles. So I hope that's clear to you, some of the vacuum bagging process. So with that said, so uh, there's ancillary vacuum bag materials that we should discuss. On the left side, I show the vacuum valve, the bagging film, the breather fabric, the release film, the tapes, fuel ply, pre prick fabric, release agent, vacuum sealant tape, you can see it in yellow there, and mold tool. So you have dams, and what is the purpose of dams? So the dams are gonna be useful for limiting lateral flow of resin. So let me show you. You see this is pointed as dam here in pink. If I have this laminate, the resin could flow out on the edges, on the lateral sides. We can prevent that by using a dam. And a typical dam will be metal, could be metal, could be flexible polymer, cork or rubber. The release film allows to release the composite from the tool. We talked about it, otherwise it gets stuck. And these are the kinds of materials you could use. The peel ply provides surface texture and protects the parts during handling or machining. These tend to be Teflon coated fabrics. You have the release fabric and the release fabric allows resin flow into the bleeders released from tool. And that, became, that can be Teflon coated woven glass, Teflon coated fabrics. I already discussed bleeder. It absorbs excess resin and I showed it here. It's usually adjacent to the composite. And it usually is going to be woven fabrics, uh, woven glass or something. Breather will distribute vacuum over the large part area. And then you have vacuum bag, which envelopes the part and tool for vacuum. And that can be a nylon or uh, silicone rubbers. Even though the general process I'm showing is similar each time, there are a number of issues that arise every time a part either changes in complexity or size. So there is an art to this process. It's just like when you make a cake or you make food in the oven. There is many ingredients, but every time somebody makes it, it's gonna be different. And so that's why it's so important that the process be certified, that be consistent, okay? So the manufacturing processes uh, is as follows. We apply the release film on top of all the pre-preg. 
The release film is perforated film that allows entrapped air to escape. So that's why we have that there. Uh, I'm, again, I'm kind of summarizing, saying like three or four different ways. So it's stuck six, I think it's important. We apply bleeder, which is, is a porous fabric on top of the release film. And that uh, lets you absorb the moisture in excess resin. Covered that already. Apply a barrier film on top of the bleeder. And the film is similar to a release film, except that it does not, it's not perforated or porous. And then we apply a brittle layer. And the brittle layer typically allows you to apply even pressure, like I said before, around the part. And at the same time, allowing air and volatiles to escape. Last week, in the previous lecture, I showed you a video of a composite manufacturing. A lot of these steps were shown there. So I hope that you've kind of really embraced composites manufacturing in a virtual environment. The final layer is back and bag, and it is an expendable approach um, that is used uh, there. Okay. So, so typical cure schedule for pre pregs the goal of the cure schedule is promote full consolidation of part and remove all possible porosity. And we want to have void contents above 1% uh, eliminated. We don't want that. We want voids to be less than 1% um, of the total material that's there. And uh, we want to achieve a satisfactory degree of cure to satisfy composite mechanical and thermal performance requirements. And most of the cures for pre-break materials follow a multi-stage profile. A um, balance must be maintained between increasing temperature to allow a decrease in viscosity. So if you increase temperature, uh, that will decrease the viscosity and that will help you remove any volatiles while not allowing full cure to progress too quickly so that gelation occurs and the material becomes solid. So it's a balance. And these, these ovens that I'm talking about are basically trying to achieve that balance. They're trying to remove the volatiles. They're trying to not get the cure too quickly. They're trying to make sure that there's cross-linking occurring. Uh, and all that needs to happen before the material becomes extremely solid. Gelation typically occurs about 60% of the degree of cure. Uh, so in the y-axis, you, you see viscosity and time. And you can see here the resin viscosity profile. Um, and you can see that the greater temperature, so at a particular time, so for example, five minutes, at five minutes I have uh, a temperature T3. Uh, and that viscosity is lower than when I look at five minutes for T4, right? For a higher temperature cure. You can see there that I have a higher, much higher viscosity for lower temperatures, for higher temperature I meant. So higher temperature leads to lower viscosity, but faster gelation, higher temperature leads to uh, a higher cure state. So how you correlate cure schedule to the mechanical property. So there is a connection. The cure schedule is optimized to get the best performance out of, out of the composite. Uh, for both, you can remove the voice to ensure it's good, B to make sure the final cure state is good to achieve the thermal and mechanical properties you need. And so bottom line here is you gotta make sure that you're achieving the right mechanical properties by making sure that voids have been removed. And you can design the cure cycles in such a manner that you're considering uh, the cure profile, the temperature profile, the pressure profile, the uh, temperature profiles to ensure that you're achieving the mechanical properties that you want. And you can study the mechanical properties during cure for various cure cycles. So you could examine, you can say, okay, the supply provided me this cure cycle. Let me check a very different cure cycle to see what will happen. You can do delta changes to understand the influence of the cure cycle. And when I say cure cycle, what I mean is when I have the pre preg in a vacuum bag environment, I cannot put that in, in the, into the oven, the autoclave. And I can then run the autoclave at a particular temperature profile and pressure profile. I showed you that already once. Let me see if I can find the slide.
Yeah, so here you can see some of that profile being shown. But I'll show one later to make it more clear. And then you wanna make sure to correlate the degree of cure to the mechanical process at different cure stages, because that helps you understand what's going on at the different stages, but also if something, go, something goes wrong. Say that the oven turned off 10 minutes into the cure process. By having gathered all that data, you can study the impacts of that. And that is not uncommon that the electricity goes out. Or the autoclave runs into a problem. So what happens really what happens really during the re resin? What happens to the resin during cure? So as, previous as I described previously, the viscosity decreases initially with temperature. So as I increase temperature, viscosity decreases. Until you have full polymerization reaction and that dominates. And a sharp increase is then observed into the, in, in, in the gelation point, okay? So you're gonna see uh, a gelation point right here. So decrease in viscosity and then uh, increase um, there. The viscosity during the first isothermal stage in the cure profile should not reach gelation since the primary goal is to remove volatiles. So first I wanna be able to promote consolidation. So that's the first thing I wanna do. And I really need to make sure I'm achieving that by getting to a low viscosity state. And I get to low viscosity by increasing temperature. I think that makes sense. The gel point can be identified by G prime and G double prime. And so that's the loss of modulus. And whenever they're crossed, you can call that the gel point. Um, and that's shown here in this picture. Uh, this point is used to design a cure profile. You can use that now. You can use this information. You know when the gel point is. So you can use that information to, to then uh, design your cure cycle. Now, usually you don't have to deal with that. Usually the supplier has done a lot of testing, a lot of thinking about what works and what doesn't work. And applied pressure or vacuum after gelation has little effect on the removal of voids. My point being is, once you gelate, you, you're, you're past the point of gelation, you have very little ability to remove voids. And that's why you have to remove voids and consolidate by decreasing vis viscosity with the initial temperatures. Um, and you, you wanna do that to get the polymers to react. Um, and uh, yeah, so once you get that going, then you can get into gelation because the gelation point is a point of the, uh, at which you have full or some polymerization and at this point you have non-reversible um, behavior, okay? So the application of temperature after gelation is only performed really to, to increase the degree of cure, to increase and enhance and to promote, 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 right? Promote the ability to, to get a final product that's fully cured as much as possible. So the glass transition is a temperature where the polymer, and as I, I told you earlier, if you waited, I will cover it, but I think it was fine back then. I'll repeat it again. The glass transition is a temperature where the polymer goes from hard, hard glassy state to a soft rubbery state with that particular temperature. So that's the transition we're talking about. There are factors, however, that do affect the TG. And that could be chain flexibility and rigidity at the microscopic level. Plasticizers used in these prepregs or composites. Cross-linking crystallinity, crystallinity uh, copolymerization, effects of intermo intermolecular forces, steric effects, which is really large groups that limit chain movement. All these things affect TG. Okay, the TG again is determined by measuring modulus using a dynamic mechanical analyzer. You can also do it with a thermal expansion test, TMA, 
or like I said before, the DSC, uh, and it can help. It can help identify that. The glass transition temperature must be defined by instrument used in the ramp rate of test. And so here you can see uh, that that's a storage modulus, that's a loss modulus, and things are kind of changing over here. So we can see we have the glass tr uh, transition occurring somewhere here in this red portion. So I went from glassy state to rubbery state, and right in the middle we can call it a TV as one approach. Uh, here I'm calling it over here because I can see a change in loss modulus. It went up and then it dropped with temperature. So something's going on there, call that TV. A polymer and composite using that same resin. So listen to me very carefully, very carefully. A polymer and a composite using that same resin will have the same TG. Both materials ex exhibit the same cure schedule. That's extremely important. Say somebody entered a cure schedule that was incorrect. Guess what? When I go through that process, I will know. I will know. Oh yeah, I will know because the TG will be different. A polymer and composite, let, let me let that sink into you because that's forensic science, guys. That, that is, gals and guys, that's forensic science. A polymer and composite using that same resin will have the same TG if both materials experience the same cure schedule. The fibers have very negligible contributions to TG, but again, the TG is basically forensic science. It's telling us the degree of cure, and if there was a problem, say there was a problem with the oven or something happened, I can check the TG. And if the TG looks different from what I qualified the material for, then I know there's something going on that I had to go and examine, All right? So that's what we're getting at here. So I wanna really go into the nuts and bolts of what is going on to the resin, what's happening to the resin during cure. And I have a figure here on the right side showing that. And what I'm showing here is time and I'm showing temperature. So this is what I call a multi-stage thermal cure schedule for curing composite prepregs. And you may say, okay, I'm increasing temperature, then I'm dropping temperature. So you can see it's not uniform, it's not constant. And there's a reason for that. Again, it's the kinds of things we talked about. People, material science put a lot of time trying to figure out how to get that low viscosity first so things are flowing well. And so I can then remove any voids, right? The debulking, the stage one process, which is here, stage one. I wanna be able to uh, apply a temperature so that I can get the temperature as uniform as possible across the whole thing, the temperature is as uniform as possible to remove the volatiles. And we don't want things to cross link there. We want them to debulk, meaning I want voids to disappear. And then I go ahead and take the sample and ramp it up one to five Fahrenheit per minute to achieve a low viscosity and allow, allow further consolidation prior to entering to stage two, before entering here. In stage two, a temperature is then chosen that will allow the resin to approximate, to basically have a low viscosity state for two hours. And you're doing that for complete weighting and removals of volatiles. So again, you're letting the resin flow in a nice way. Typically you wanna apply pressure at the same time to increase fiber volume and basically remove these voids that are in the resin, to remain any, any remaining voids in the resin. This polymerization reaction is faster than is occurring in stage one, uh, as we're, we're showing uh, in these viscosity plots. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to see how this maps in here, but uh, the gelation is usually designed uh, to occur at the end of stage two. So over here, I'm getting some gelation already, okay? And so that, that's where things are getting, uh, we're getting things for real. The sample is then heated to stage three to allow full cure of the resin. 
right? So I have full cure of the resin now. We, we want to get there. I'm sorry. We want to get to the full cure of the resin. And uh, you need to come up with a time and temperature that will achieve 80 to 95% of the cure state. And you can see how I'm crossing that glass transition temperature. That's the glass transition temperature there. This high temperature state is necessary to reach, reach this degree of cure. Long duration and lower temperature is not typically sufficient. If I just kept a stage two, that's not gonna help all the time. So the pressure and vacuum are released at the end of stage three. And even the material has gelled, this is often a good practice to ensure minimal interaction with moisture sensitive resins during cure. And now I'll cool up, cool the part. And once I cool it and it's not hot anymore, you can remove it and you're ready to, to use uh, the material. I wanna point out that there's a lot of models that have been developed to, to model the cure process. And, but the, it's, it's very complex and it requires a heat transfer model, flow models, cure kinetic models, and analysis, structural analysis models. And the cure kinetic models require being able to model the time, time temperature isotherms, the degree of cure, glass transition temperature, um, and so forth. So uh, these models have been effectively used to utilize and have been utilized to determine an optimized cure schedule for composite processing. So people have used these analytical models to really optimize what this looks like for a particular application, pressure and temperature. And, but the reality is that you can apply these models, but you have to test them out and you can look at what mechanical properties you're getting out of them through a study. And so I, I think that's what I'm talking about here is, um, yeah, so that's what we're talking about there. Um, give, give me a second. Moving on here. So I do wanna discuss the TG of the composite after different stages. As, it, as I discussed before, that glass transition temperature is increasing as a, as a function of stage. So initially the TG is fairly low. Here are two different materials. Um, basically the same resin, but different um, composite. And then you can see here that or different formulations of that resin. You can see here that it is increasing and then it achieves a uh, basically a constant state. And in this case, the cure temperature, the TG is about 180. So when it's fully cured, you've achieved a, a TG that's going to be that one, as an example. Um, the, you can, what is very interesting and I, I find it very, very appealing to look at, um, it's, it's actually a very insane idea. If I do a test, a mechanical test, I take a composite and I were to test the composite and get the strength of that composite. The good news is that the strength of the composite, you can see here, if I were to, okay, let's say I have the prepreg uh, and I have a laminate and it was in, in, this, in this initial state. At the end of that initial state, I could take it out, out of the oven to, to then test it and see what happens. Then I have another sample. The sample goes through initial stages and then during the ramp stage, I take it out. And I do a test, a mechanical test, and I measure the strength and, and so forth. When the glass transition temperature crosses that temperature uh, of the oven, I take it out and I test it again. What is highly interesting, very interesting, is that the strength of that material is, is, is following a very similar curve as a TG. You can correlate the mechanical and thermal properties of the cured state, which is quite insane. And, and, and the reason that's amazingly awesome, you can see here how this formula here has SBS, which is a short beam shear. Uh, that's what SBS means, short beam shear. I'll be discuss that later, uh, what that test looks like. Uh, and you can see here the TG is included in the equation and I can calculate the short beam shear strength. And what is amazing about this is that you can make a relationship 
that fits uh, this to that graph. Okay, so the TG is completely correlated to that. So say, for example, what, why is this useful? Say, for example, the electricity went out or the cure of a huge, huge part went out. The, 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 the autoclave that was being used in the processing, processing of a huge part stopped working in the middle of stage two or three. I know what the impact is to the strength. Obviously, I don't want a strength of 40, 40. I would like to have a strength of 80. The most I can get out of it, right? So, yeah, so th that's the point I want to make because I, I, I think it's important to understand the role of TG. TG plays a big role in what uh, composites are all about, uh, and it is tracked carefully. But it, is, it is a piece of the puzzle that provides signature uh, experience, right, about the part. Composite parts must be cured by a simultaneous combination of heat and pressure while under vacuum. Uh, so you, you definitely wanna uh, apply heat and pressure under vacuum. And the vacuum is applied to remove air and volatile products. While the heat provides the thermal energy necessary for the resin to flow and polymerize to achieve proper cure. Autoclave pressure of 3,200 PSI is typically applied so that, that oven right here is applying also pressure to further consolidate the part. And what you're trying to do, you're trying to collapse the remaining small voids that have not migrated out of that part. So yeah, so something to consider there that, that I think we have to think about. The cure cycle has to be optimized. We wanna optimize it to get the maximum performance out of the mechanical properties that we can. And we wanna cure, the cure cycle has to be optimized to control the rheology, which means that how the resin flows. Um, and the heat reaction, uh, which also means multiple steps uh, need to be looked at carefully to reduce possible exotherms. So we can achieve the final cure state. And the pressure is typically in these ovens are applied with nitrogen gas, typically. And you can see here the part. So say I took this part here, this part, and brought it into the autoclave. Uh, that's that part right there, and it's, it's vacuum bag. I'm applying pressure. I have a thermocouple, and I'm pulling vacuum as well. And I'm checking everything to make sure nothing is leaking, nothing is, uh, um, that everything is working properly. The vacuum bag part is loaded in a high pressure autoclave for cure, and that's, that's a benefit of the vacuum bag. It, it helps with everything we're trying to do. How are voids removed? I think I wanna describe this process because it's an interesting process that um, occurs. In autoclave processing, the, under high pressure, what we're doing is reducing the void sizes by compression. And it dissolves the voids by increasing solubility of the gas makes the voids more mobile due to increase in resin velocity. And the typical void levels from autoclave processes should be in the half percent to 1%. If it's more than 1%, there could be an issue with the processing. But you can see here how porosity percentage, and what I'm talking about porosity here, I'm talking about porosity is directly correlated to void content, how much void it have within the composite. And so the more voids I have, the more porosity I have, and I'll explain later how that's measured. But the bottom line is the more pressure I apply to the sample, the more benefits I have in terms of removing those voids and the porosity is dropping. Now, the point I wanna make is temperature has very little influence. You can see here, it has some influence, but not extensively. Uh, about here, you get about that pressure, you get about the same amount of porosity, but I also want to notice how increasing pressure is not helping too much. So there's a point of, of um, the investment is not, very little return on investment in terms of increasing pressure. And increasing pressure can be bad in some applications. Say you have a sandwich core, uh, and we discussed a sandwich core last week. You have foam, and then you have facies. If you apply too much pressure, you could crush the core. And I'll give an example later on about this. The autoclave processing, um, you know, I wanna kind of show you what's going on. Um, you have these voids that are gonna to try to escape 
and, and we're hoping it could occur uh, through bubble compression. Uh, so the void is migrating, the void compression, void formation, and finally, boom, it goes out. And that's what we want to see. A typical two-stage autoclave auto cure cycle, I do want to point out that voids, this kind of porosity will decrease the properties, mechanical properties of the material. So not only you have lower TG can result in lower properties, you could also have the situation where the porosity, the number of voids within the structure can also decrease. Um, yeah, the number of voids can also decrease the strength. And that makes sense because if in stage one, suddenly the whole thing stops operating, well, the whole point of stage one was to remove voids. But if in stage one, everything stops operating, then I will have voids and voids are stress concentrations. And I was not able to get rid of the stress concentrations. So therefore, those stress concentrations decrease the strength of that laminate that I'm curing. And here was the part we, we talked about in the previous page when I showed you. So the type of fiber, and here I'm showing you two-stage autoclave cure cycle. You can see here that I have vacuum here and I have pressure applied. So you can see here uh, that you still have vacuum the whole time and then you're, deep, you're applying pressure to some level and then you also have temperature being applied. A bottom line is the type of fiber has very little effect on the selective cure cycle schedule. The initial ramp here is centralized on the decrease of resin viscosity. And then the part is then held isothermally at the first cure isotherm to allow the removal of volatiles. I discussed this already. Uh, then the pressure is applied about there. This allows consolidation and full collapse of remaining voids. Um, yeah, so that's, we we'll cover that. By the end of the first exotherm, the material has been cured to some extent, 40 to 50%. Uh, and then we ramp it up again to a second isotherm. And the idea there is to start gelling the materials uh, on the second transition ramp we see there uh, at the early stage of the second isotherm. And then you can hold it there for four hours, two to four hours to achieve most of the cure in this time period. And here's an example of how voids in a composite, say I didn't do a good job in stage one when things are supposed to work well. Well, if I don't do a good job there, then potentially uh, I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of voids in the composite, which will decrease the strength of the composite. So what is a weak link in pre-pre composite? The weak link is really the carbon fiber. Uh, it's extremely st st stable, so that's not gonna do it. But uh, carbon fibers are sensitive to handling damage, kinks, breakage during pre pre There's slight aging issues due to sizing, uh, typically in excess of 15 years. Resin, the degree of cure is temperature time dependent. We cover that a lot. Majority of the resin stored at a cold temperatures uh, are, is, is done to limit the reaction. You have aging during storing, storage. So we talked about that, the date of the manufacturer. Out time, how long it can be out of the freezer, we talked about that. If aging occurs, the standard cure profile may not be optimized already, may not be the right one. So you have to kind of study that too. So we call those aging studies. Aging increases viscosity, meaning things are not flowing as smoothly, and since things are not flowing as smoothly, then it increases the voids and it can impact structural performance. Just take glue, glue from the store. If you leave it out for a long time, I don't expect it to be as viscous. Things may not glue as well. Does that make sense? So resin can react with the environment. Also, there's another thing that can happen and result in a compromised final cure product. So it can also affect the TG. Issues regarding correct stochastic so geometric um, of the hardener and the epoxy is important. So that correct mixture of the two is important to get a proper racing formulation that's of high performance. Quality control, we cover that, but this is a summary slide. So that's what, I, what why I'm covering here. We do thermal analysis, dynamic mechanical analysis, uh, differential scanning, cal cal 
calorimetry. Um, we have thermal gravimetric analysis. Any of those can be used to look at the quality control, the prepreg, rheological testing, chemical, chemical testing is also performed, uh, like the Fourier transform stuff that we talked about, and so for the gelation uh, also. But in general, what is a weak link between resin and fiber? I have to go with the resin. The resin is weaker in terms of strength, but it's also very sensitive to the processing. Very sensitive. Okay. So what if something goes wrong? What if something goes wrong at any of these stages here? All right, so something went wrong in stage one. So the good news is there was a bag leak. As an, and I'm giving you examples from my experience. So say there's a bag leak at stage one. So I'm not able to keep vacuum. The good news is you should be fine. There is no gelation yet. You can return back since the resin really hasn't advanced in terms of polymeric cross-linking. So you can kind of start over again and redo your bag, the bag for the vacuum. You have a bag leak now at stage two. That can be a problem area because I start to have some amount of gelling. Um, it's not fully gelled, but you may want to determine the severity of what occurred there through additional testing. That's what's recommended. Now, if you have a bag leak here in the second ramp, now we're looking at a problem area uh, because now you're into the gelation and the bag leak is supposed to be there for consolidation to make sure everything's, the voids are getting removed. Right, and if I'm not getting that, that could be a problem. The autoclave say pressure stops in stage two or three. So if the pressure of the autoclave stops here, you may have a problem, usually non-recoverable. If the autoclave pressure stops at stage four or five, that's a little bit better. It doesn't matter anymore because consolidation was supposed to happen over here in this one through three. So the pressure again is there to help us out. Um, in that in, in consolidating. The temp controller stops in stage one. You can recover that. The temp controller stops in stage two. It's unlikely you can recover because now again you have some amount of cross-linking. In stage three, it will damage the part. And stage four, no problem with respect to cure unless it cools too fast. If it cools too fast, you can have an issue. If it cools too slow, it shouldn't be a problem. But bottom line is there is a number of issues that could go wrong in the manufacturing composites. And I was describing today that things can go wrong. Here are uh, errors that could go, could, could occur during pre-preg layup and cure procedures. Common errors occurring during hand layup and autoclave cure and implications for quality. So here you have the process step, the tool preparation. A common error is that there's incomplete cleaning or failure to apply release film or spray. What is implication? Implication is that you will have surface imperfections if you don't have good cleaning and you have undulations in the surface, which can decrease the strength of the composite. The tool preparation will then also, uh, if you have failure to remove the apply release film, then the part that you're making is gonna be stuck. And this, uh, you know, issues here that you wanna look at top level view is contamination of issues, top level view. Debulking, uh, failure to debulk the entire part area can lead to void air entrapment, air entrapment leading to void formation. Failure to force a pre-preg into the mold detail means that you may have inadequate consolidation and resin buildup. We wanna really limit voids. Uh, we wanna limit voids to perhaps 1% is our goal, but we don't want it to be greater than 2%. It's the typical limit used in the aerospace industry. Layup, an incorrect ply angle can be a problem. I'll bring that up later. That'll give very bad results. Say I want a ply angle of 0, 15, 40, but now I have 90, 90, 90. That, that's completely wrong. So the part needs to be completely discarded. Um, inclusion of backing paper or foreign objects. So now you have a backing paper, something was left behind between the plies. That's gonna reduce the mechanical properties. That's not a good thing. And that will be a failure initiation point. Something leaves, somebody leaves a paint chip or something between the plies, that can be a problem. And backing paper tends to be one of those things 
because these rolls typically come in backing paper. So this roll here, let me see if I find the image. This roll usually comes with a backing paper so that this, right, does not stick on itself. We don't want this to stick on itself as it's being rolled. I'm sure all of you have experienced using tape for maybe three years after you used it last time. I mean, everything's kind of stuck and you have to kind of figure out where, how to open, you know, how to get the tape restarted and initiated for application. Very similar concept here, we use backing paper and sometimes backing papers can be left behind by error. Fader to starter darts, um, sp a splitting of prepreg, you know, that can reduce mechanical properties. And then here is a placement of ancillary materials in the manufacturing, fader to apply release films. It, again, it's gonna, it's gonna get stuck. Inadequate bleeders means that I don't have uh, the resin The resin, um, so just a second, I lost my train of thought. I apologize for that. But the, the inadequate bleeders means that you may have resin buildup or low fiber volume fraction. Failure to form into mold details that can, again, no consolidation there um, and so forth. Vacuum bagging, failure to fold into mold details. Uh, inadequate sealing, incorrect temperature profile, inadequate pressurization, back fader, all these things will lead into loss of a part, voids, uneven cure, loss of vacuum. So you have to look at each of these and kind of look at the implications, right? Inadequate pressurization is obvious. Voids, low vo fire volume fraction, high vo void content, porosity, incorrect temperature profile, uneven cure, low fire volume fraction, voids, resin degradation. Inadequate ceiling, loss of vacuum, and so forth. So this can lead to typical loss of part, depending upon what issue arises. And so we have to be cognizant of that. We have to be, okay? Uh, we, we'll continue the coverage of manufacturing uh, of composites through some case studies. And uh, for now, uh, I, I thank you for, for listening to this lecture. <laughs>